A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm indeed honored and privileged to have the second season of the Career Conversations, Maximizing Career Guidance and Career Development. Today, we have a very uh, distinguished guest from Canada, Mr. Riz Ibrahim, who is the Executive Director of CERIC. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Riz. Thank you, Raza. Pleasure to be here. So as you know, uh, this is a series I started about six months back uh, in the COVID pandemic uh, to basically uh, ignite uh, the importance of career development. And you are uh, currently presenting a very important organization doing great work in Canada. Uh, I went on your website and I really enjoyed your strategic mandate. And you talk about promoting career development as a priority for the public good. And second of all, building career development knowledge, mindsets and competencies. So I think we will start off with, with this very strategic mandate that I think can really influence uh, not only Canadians, but um, uh, global citizens across the globe. Can you share your insights on that, please? Sure. Uh, these two mandates um, that we actually uh, have now uh, are fairly recent mandates for us. And it uh, allowed us to really fine tune where we thought we needed to put our energies uh, and where we thought it was really important for our energies to have the impacts that we wanted to have, the societal changes that we wanted to have. So the two mandates you talked about, the first one was career development for the uh, for public good, is really sort of an external mandate, if you will. Uh, and it engages people outside of our circles, outside of our ecosystem, to bring them in, to uh, evangelize them, if you will. The second one, the one you wanted to start off with, uh, is really more sort of inside baseball. It's really within the field, it's really looking at developing the knowledge, skills, mindsets, competencies of people that are working day to day in career development. And the net impact of what we do with that is also bringing in fulfillment for um, people outside of the field. So the basic premise is fairly straightforward. If we enhance the knowledge, skills, competencies, and mindsets of people that are working in career development, they will provide better services, more prudent services, more timely services, more impactful service to the clients or students or whoever they are that they serve. And those people will then have uh, more fulfilling careers and live more fulfilling lives. Wonderful. Uh, can you share your insights very briefly? How did you enter the field of career development? What was your um, influence of entering this field of transforming people? So I would say that I'm probably a poster child for how you get into a career, which is my education has no resemblance to what I ended up doing in life. Um, and uh, so I meandered and I just managed to get into it by happenstance. And it was really a series of jobs that brought me skills, that brought me some ideas of the values that I had in the work uh, that I was doing that I really liked, which took me to the next job, which helped to build more skills, so on and so forth. In that journey, um, I was introduced to um, ideas of social justice, working with marginalized communities uh, and uh, working with youth. And it was the combination of all of these three things. And I didn't realize at the time that it was actually the combination of all of these three, these three things that would define my career. It was the idea that I wanted to make people's lives better. Uh, it was the idea that I wanted to see communities be uplifted and very much in line with my personality was the idea that I like to do all of this stuff in the background, um, that I like to help other people help themselves and make a better world. Wonderful, very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, how can we increase access and especially to the people that are very vulnerable as you mentioned uh, previously, how can we increase access as career practitioners in this pandemic where digital access is, a, is indeed a luxury People, a lot of people, um, uh, communities across the globe, they don't have the luxury of technology. So, what what will be your wisdom on uh, on increasing our outreach to those disadvantaged, marginalized communities? So, I think we have to look at it from the perspective of where we are in the pandemic and what the differential access to technology is. I agree with you that one of the things that has really become evident um, throughout, well, at least in Canada, I can't speak globally, but at least in Canada, what's become evident is that there's a huge digital divide. So the previous assumption that we might have made that um, internet is accessible to everybody and therefore if you put things online, everybody can access it. The previous thinking was that the internet is the great leveler. 
Um, you put stuff online, more people can access it, therefore it's a broader distribution, but actually that's not the case. That we have uh, many pockets in Canada where they don't have internet access or they don't have good internet access or they, have, they don't have broadband access. So the idea of putting videos like this up means that already it's a barrier to access to a lot of people who can't access things like this. So then you have to sort of think, okay, if we can accept and embrace that reality, what other options can we present? And you always, <laughs> almost have to go back in time, back in time to a period when there was no internet. How did we communicate? How did we share services? How do we um, connect with our communities and build our communities and provide services to our communities? We have to go back in time and sort of say, okay, those tried and true principles that we had, we need to revisit those because they were working. Now, for some, internet makes things more efficient, but for others, it's not possible. So we go back to ensuring that we are able to provide services by phone, uh, different kinds of walk-in, if that's allowed by local conditions. And in the pandemic, this is the case. Um, we had all sorts of people during lockdown periods in our country uh, where services were not possible. You could not go to your local employment center. You could not meet with your um, counselor. Um, but some of those agencies were able to keep their phone lines open. Uh, so that there was some connection, um, at least between themselves and their clients. That was a lifeline. And it's important to recognize that lifelines are different in different times and based on different technologies. Excellent, very inspiring. Uh, you uh, recommended that why not restore to those technologies Techniques, those trial techniques that we used prior to the internet. And as you mentioned that, you know, helplines are very useful when you cannot come due to various social distancing and various pandemic challenges. And I would like to share an example of South Africa where mobile technology and where telephones were used as a, as a very effective strategy for career guidance reforms. Uh, as you know, uh, Mr. Riz, that this uh, special uh, series of YouTube on digitalizing uh, career conversations uh, this is from the inspiration of IABG's international conference this year uh, in 2021 in October, hopefully if everything goes well, on maximizing career guidance and career development. So what will be your wisdom on how can we as career, as the careers community amplify our profession in our respective communities, uh, uh, not just uh, nationally, but globally? I think, I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to challenge the traditional notions of career, especially if we're looking at things globally. Um, different uh, countries have different ideas of what career is, and they're mm -hmm. going through different stages of development. So the notion of career and what career means and is situated within, within society is a little bit different. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge that and use that as a rallying point to start to challenge how we might mobilize around the, sort of maybe the spectrum, if you will, of what, what this means. Um, the other thing I think um, also is when we're looking from a global perspective, we have to situate career within local and global labor markets. So what does it mean to have a career locally, domestically? What does it mean to have that career globally? And, and I think we have to be open to the idea that careers can be spirited globally by technology, by other means, um, that, that that's all quite possible. The idea of the portable career, the boundaryless career um, is really here in this era. But for us to embrace it, I think we have to recognize that there are some dynamics in that we have to consider um, when we're looking internationally. Um, and then I think also we have to uh, understand the, uh, the societal contributions or the societal cultures um, that impact the inputs and the outputs of career. So what's the vested interest um, of industry, government, um, other uh, players in the ecosystem towards developing the careers of the people in the workforce? Wonderful. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You talked about the workforce. How can career development bridge the gap between industry and academia? I know that's uh, that's a very um, uh, heated debate and a very uh, consistent uh, um, uh, perspective. People share their insights. So how can we bridge the gap? Um, uh, how can career development bridge the gap between industry and academia? 
So I think we have to have a tighter link between um, between the two. Mm -hmm. So is it is it do what you learn, um, or is it more a philosophy of do all the things that you learn? <laughs> and it's just that the educate the formal academic part is one component of it. Um, now we are seeing we are seeing a sea change in the in the recognition the connection between formal education and the labor market. We're certainly seeing that. We're seeing a recognition that people coming out of colleges and universities need some real world grounding in some respects, some work experience. So you see a proliferation of experiential learning programs, much more so than you say maybe 10 years ago um, or 15 years ago. Um, so you see that, you see the idea of work integrated learning, you see co-curricular um, sort of uh, documentation uh, where there's a recognition that it's not just what you formally learn in the classroom, it's the other, uh, it's the other stuff as well that need to be factored in, um, which is great because it's a holistic perspective on the individual. When an individual comes out of a post-secondary learning institution, they're not just a product of that course that they took, it's the whole experience. Um, okay. And we see this now um, in the pandemic uh, as well, where that face-to-face -face interactions uh, sort of be missing and people have been having to do the, their learning online. So it's really, it's really um, uh, segmented the learning part from the social part uh, and the social development part. Those are important components, how you interact with your, your classmates, your, your teams in doing projects and things like that. Those are important parts of, of skills that you bring into the workforce. Okay. So Excellent. I think, I think there's that uh, that needs to be factored in. Um, as you know, the United Nations has various designated days uh, for various international causes, like the International Women's Day was recently celebrated, uh, the Youth Day, the Labor's Day, uh, Children's Day, Teacher's Day. So why not, as a career uh, professional community, why not we advocate collectively for International Careers Day that promotes livelihood and contributes to UN sus uh, sustainable goals? A valuable perspective on that. I think that's an excellent idea. Um, I would go back again to uh, the idea of a common understanding of career and it's situated, uh, how it's situated globally. I, I know many countries have uh, national career days. Uh, in Canada, we have a national um, career month um, mm -hmm. uh, as well. And we had a, it used to be a national career week. Uh, but so there is an emphasis on careers um, individually. I think, I think part of what we need, and I believe we saw this in Australia many years ago, was the government backing for um, this kind of an initiative. Because um, mm -hmm. it's one thing to declare the day, it's another thing, and you know this as a marketing person, you need to really amplify this and get it into people's minds and in front of people's faces uh, for it to make a difference. Um, and so that requires uh, resources and it requires capacity and it requires commitment, uh, probably above and beyond what's just within each of the communities of career development professionals. Very true. And last but not the least, um, I would like to uh, request a message, an inspiration message to all the practitioners, the scholars, the researchers that are listening to you across the globe. Uh, what will be your message for career development practitioners and people that are involved in this field that are contributing towards UN sustainable goals? I would say career development is for the public good, for the greater good. And we know that career development helps people create purposeful lives and productive lives. And those two things create better and healthier communities. So carry on Wonderful. and do more. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Riz. Uh, it was a pleasure to learn from your valuable perspectives in Canada. And for viewers, um, uh, we will be uh, inviting a new guest for our next episode. Of season two this season this uh, series is now growing more impact and i'm passionate to bring new perspectives from across the globe of friends that i've met over the years thank you once again for your time thank you thank you